We'll start our next lecture is by Lance Bossard. Lance is a distinguished professor in the atmospheric and environmental sciences department at uh, SUNY Albany. Lance has broad research interests on in planetary scale, synoptic scale, and mesoscale meteorology. Lance works on a variety of multi-scale research problems that relate to weather and climate of higher and mid-latitude regions, as well as tropics. Research problems that Lance works on involve winter storms, hurricanes, organized convective systems, and the predictability of individual flow regimes that are especially attractive to him. His current research projects focus on observational and modeling studies of synoptic and mesoscale phenomena from a multi-scale perspective. And yeah, Lance really enjoys working with students. And from what I've heard from his students, his students really enjoy working with him as well. Um, just on a personal note, um, Lance organized the ASP Colloquium on Weather and Climate um, Intersection or Interactions about a decade ago. And um, Lance was one of the main organizers and that ASP Colloquium was a huge success. And a lot of what we are doing now uh, is also modeled on um, that ASP and it had a huge impact on my career as a student participant then. So thanks Lance for being a long-term ASP Colloquium organizer and contributing to a community. Welcome, Anisha. It was a great having you in that colloquium back in 2012. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about some synoptic dynamic meteorology concepts, concepts that are relevant to when you think about the S2S timescale problem. And I want to acknowledge my two colloquium students, Tyler Light and Alex Mitchell, because they're very good at keeping me on my toes and making sure that I toe the line, so to speak. All right. So we're start out with a little overview of forecasting skills because there's some issues that tend to get lost in the in all the uncertainty or, or all the arguing about whether it's a good forecast or a bad forecast. Um, I'll also talk about a couple of interesting West Coast forecast uncertainty events from January 2017 and February 2019. We need to talk a little bit about potential vorticity and potential vorticity streamers, and then um, in one of the the big. Um, Elephant, one of the elephants in the room and predictability issues is recurving and transitioning Western Pacific tropical cyclones create all kinds of downstream forecast mayhem. And then uh, conclude with some discussion of Q vectors and jet streams and to try and point out why that matters for uh, sub S2S forecasting. So let's start out with an overview of forecasting, forecasting skill. This is taken from the European Center. It's the anomaly correlation coefficient of over 40, uh, 41-year uh, period um, at 500 millibars from 1981 to 2021, uh, and it's day three, uh, five, seven, and ten. Um, the, the all the colors you see on the left, the gap that's between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So there's more skill in the northern hemisphere, but the advent of excellent satellite coverage and polar orbiters, in particular, here in the um, period of 2000 to 2004, basically closed the gap. And it also increased the increased the skill, but you see your it's think the curves are leaning over and starting to flatten. Um, so that's a sign that we're we're starting to saturate our skill. And if you look at the uh, continuous rank probability skill score um, that Tim Palmer really likes, and I think is the best way to ver verify probabilistic forecast on 850 millibar temperature reaching a threshold of 25 percent you can see the, the steady increase into about 2010. And then we really plateaued and now there's been a, a gradual slow increase um, to basically getting out to about day nine and 10 on the information. So we're, we're, we're kind of reaching some of the limits. So, and then we look at, uh, say we look at the most recent CPC forecast, the most recent winter. Um, the only way to summarize it is Houston, we have a problem. If you look at the top forecast, the surface temperature anomaly forecast for December, January, February, above normal pretty much everywhere. The only question is how above normal. The ver verification shows this big cold gap down through here because there happened to be the great cold outbreak in, in February uh, uh, 21, 2021, for which there was the forecasts were, were clueless. And also I should point out that we're getting a free ride on skill because you, if you don't know, you should always forecast above warm with an upper trend in the 
in the data, you can show skill, but it's all artificial. Forecast reliability is an important process. Um, so if we look at some of the, the TIGI, this is uh, Thorpex Interactive Grand Global Ensemble. I can't remember what the acronym Thorpex stands for. I, I, I look it up and I forget it after five seconds um, in there, but basically, and then the tertiary one is the, the MCGE, help um, in through here. But nevertheless, when you do this and you look at forecast reliability, um, let's just think about this. Reliability diagram, observed probability and forecast probability ought to match. If they don't match, there's a problem. So perfect reliability would be right on the X axis, Y on the 45 degree slope line. Poor reliability, in this case, overconfident, you're flat down the curve this way. Underconfident would be in the other way. Okay. So here's the National Weather Service, over 2 million forecasts from the National Weather Service between 1994 and 2004 in the Eastern region, showing they observed frequency of probability of precipitation and the reliability in the 24 hour forecast. Remarkably uh, reliable forecast, a little overconfident at the higher end, for example, and down near zero, um, down and through here. When I show this to economists in the depart uh, economics department at Albany, they just go, you've got to be kidding me. They just assumed the forecasts were jokes. Um, the fact that they're reliable comes as a lot of astonishment to people, to users of, of, of these forecasts. So that's a, that's a very important part of the process to how reliable the forecasts are. Now, the basis for ensemble prediction. I love this figure from the European Center, which I call lumpy and bumpy PDFs because in, in say the temperature, here's the PDF, it's sideways, the initial condition, forecast time, forecast. Um, the tendency is when talking about extended forecasts is to show PDFs that broaden and flatten. But in reality, PDFs may develop multiple, multiple maxima. Um, in, 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 in this is the example of three of them in through here. So you have all this uncertainty of how the solutions can diverge with time, but they're, gonna, they're not going to diverge in nice uniform ways. They're going to diverge in very uh, unpredictable ways. So how reliable then are some of these forecasts? This is for extreme precipitation from the Tiki, uh, for, this is from the year 2007 to 2013. Three days, five days, nine days, and 15 days. The grand global ensemble of everything on the left side, European Center in this column, Japanese Meteorological Agency in that column, NCEP in this column, United, UK Met Office uh, in this column. Let's just go down to 15 days. Um, note that the European Center uh, this is the, the no skill, no skill line, basically goes, crashes into the, the zero axis here at the other range. So basically nobody has any real skill and no, no surprise there, but the grand, the global ensemble of averaging everything together does a little bit better than all the individual models. And it really shows up at nine days, um, for example, out uh, in through here, pretty reliable even at nine days, even though all the individual members are overconfident in through here. And, but clearly the European Center during this particular six year period is the model of choice overall. But the ultimate model of choice is the grand global ensemble. This is for high temperature. Similar kind of record for high temperature shows up again. Um, issues with the overall, but overall the grand global ensemble is there. Uh, relative to everybody else. But after about nine days, there's a rapid decay in skill between nine days and 15 days, which is this limit of two weeks of predictability that we have seen so many times and Ed Lorenz told us about a long time ago. Um, you can also look at things like reliability of tropical cyclone intensity forecasts in through here. And you can see anything to the left of the 45 degree slope line um, they're not like, for example, here in the, in the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, it's very, very tough to the model to predict anything below 980 hectopascal central pressure. Whereas the European center over here has both sides of the line, more on this side of the line of the under forecasting than on the over forecasting side um, and through here. But you can certainly see the differences between the individual uh, centers. For example, the uh, German Weather Service and through here is mostly under, under predicting the intensity of the stronger uh, uh, cyclones um, and, and through here. Same with Medio France oh, uh, down and through here. So you can, you can look at this reliability of all kinds of forecasts. This happens to be intensity and it's a useful thing to do. 
Now, something we don't do very often is what I call animal farm meteorology. All forecasts are equal, but some forecasts are more equal than other forecasts. We lump everything together. But what happens, and Ron McTaggart Cowan of Environment Canada uh, sent me this. This is a, a month of, of, this is in February, a whole month, of, this is February of, of 2019, in through here, the day-to-day -day anomaly correlation coefficient. And this is the time when the, all the real forecast problems on the west coast of the United States, this is for the whole northern hemisphere, but you can see there were two major periods or for the northern, whole northern hemisphere where predictability was much lower than if you just took a simple mean predictability here and didn't really consider what the day-to-day -day variability is. These are the issues that basically contribute, and these are the important kinds of weather regimes when these happen. And these are the things we need to pay attention to, but they get lost in the sauce when you do all the averaging. So all forecasts are local, like politics. And Alan Pearson, who used to be the uh, director of the National Severe Storms Forecast Center, which was the predecessor to the Storm Prediction Center, always told this hilarious story um, of a woman who would all, and that was based at her base in Kansas City at the time, woman out near Topeka, Kansas, who would call him up after every forecast for a severe thunderstorm and say, you guys don't know what you're doing. Nothing ever, nothing happened here. This went on for years. And then finally, one day she called and say, all in excited voice say, now we're getting somewhere. I lost the roof of my barn last night. You guys are finally figuring it out. So that really illustrates the, the whole issue of um, forecast, forecast predictability, um, forecast matter at the local level. So some realities is forecast, weather forecasting much better in 2021 than 50 years ago? Yes, much better. However, our customers expect more from us and they have different views of success than we do. All forecasts are local across all, all time scales, but backyard meteorology, so to speak, matters. And, um, and sometimes when we talk about like on uh, S2S timescales for predictability being very, very small at week two or three in there, we're arguing, we're really arguing to ourselves in the weeds because it's not actionable information as far as most users would be concerned. So one of the, one of the challenges is how to get to the point where we can have actionable information on S2S timescales. So here's an example of a significant GFS forecast error from January 2017. And this was when there, uh, it was a California deluge on the, in California on the 8th and 9th of January in through here. And so based on deterministic forecast verifying on uh, 12Z on the 8th of January 2017, here's a 210 hour forecast. And the con solid contours of sea level pressure, the 1,005 thickness is the dashed lines, going from red to blue at the 540 decameter thickness. And all the shaded represent the strength of the jet starting at 40, 40 meters per second and through here. So you see you have one jet up to the north, anticyclonically curved, suggesting there's a block up there. And then a, the Pacific jet coming off the Asian coast, extending eastward, and another jet coming in over northern northwestern Mexico. This is the 210 hour forecast and this is a time when all things were going rapidly south in California, but you'd never know it from the 210 forecast. Here's the 180 forecast verifying the same time. Let me toggle back and forth. And you can see how the changes in the jet structure along on the, on the West Coast. And also look at the cyclone off the coast of Japan there in the, um, uh, uh, excuse me, off the coast of Kamkatia uh, in the, uh, for, uh, the 210 forecast is now a big hole in the Western Pacific out and through here, the jets move north. Now you go to 90 hours and the jet moves further north and it's into Northern California and Oregon. So that big difference in where the jet was located suggests a much more amplified flow pattern. And that made a one heck of a difference to the forecast. And you can see it in the corresponding precipitable water forecast, the 210 forecast, the first orange is 24 millimeters. There's no real atmospheric river activity in the 210 forecast. 180 forecast verifying at the same time, you see the atmospheric river now, you have one to the east here coming into extreme Southern California, Northwestern Mexico, and one out in the East Central Pacific. Then you look at the 90 hour forecast when it locked in, this one becomes the dominant figure. And this is where all the uh, issues occurred in California. So I'll, I'll show, show you a couple of loops on this quickly. Uh, the, the 500 millibar high, uh, heights, winds and vertical motion, Ascent only in through here and then thicknesses in through here. Um, 
This is the 500 mil of the Vortistia shea. So you can see how the ridge keeps changing its configuration as disturbances crawl up the back side of the ridge and then come down the east side of the ridge and cut off lows. Um, the blue is the area where there's strong asset. So the evolution of the anticyclone upstream, it's continually evolving and how that works and how disturbances go up the west side and the east side matter greatly. And you can now look at it in terms of sea level pressure. It's the same thing with the jets. And again, you see the disturbances crawling up the back side of the ridge, rebuild the ridge, and then they eventually break underneath the ridge. Well, the transition from going up and over the ridge to breaking under the ridge is very crucial for how much rain falls on the western coast. So some of the takeaways from that would be like blocking and cyclonic wave breaking and cutoff cyclones prevail. You have anticyclonic wave breaking. Uh, it's common across the North Pacific. And uh, all of that, uh, al when it allows the deep moisture to reach the West Coast and there's a California del deluge and a Portland snowstorm that result. If we look at uh, two years later, February 2019, meteorological mayhem on the West Coast. Uh, Tyler Light made this diagram, shows the mean, the time mean 250 millibar heights and winds for the uh, first 15 days in February. And you can see you basically have like what looks like a Rex block this way and kind of an Omega block that way. Um, but basically have a blocking pattern in the East Central Pacific along 150 West. But how did you get there? Um, and I point out that time mean maps, users beware, time averaging may hide important synoptic dynamic flow signals. So you can look at the, over a seven day period into here, 500 millibar heights on the left, standardized height anomalies are shaded. So blue, the cold colors are negative standard anomalies, standardized, and the warm colors are warm standardized anomalies. Same thing on the right, 500 millibar heights, standard price precipitable water anomalies aren't shaded. So what you see is the high precipitable water anomalies that extend well poleward on the west side of the ridge, ahead of the trough, all the way up to high latitudes. And there's also a weak Kona low here, which is gonna allow for moisture to come in out of the tropical Pacific into mid latitudes. So that's one day later, two days later, and the streams are coming towards the coast now, but note the ridge building in the Pacific. See how the ridge, the leading edge of the ridge is replaced by upstream ridging to the west, continually to the west. And then what, what happens is as the ridge becomes very elongated in through here at 500 millibars, the trough coming down the east side merges with a Kona low and that allows high precipitable water. There it's now merged right in through here now you've got plus six sigma precipitable water values off the coast of Baja, which are coming inland. And that led to the 30, third rainiest day ever in Palm Springs, California, and that and other widespread flooding in parts of Arizona and, and Southern California. So a little dynamics um, here, talk about potential vorticity, potential vorticity streamers and Rossby wave breaking. First of all, PV is basically on um, theta surface, the product of the absolute vorticity times the stability in through here. Um, one PV unit, the, the units that we use PV units because who's gonna write down for all these units um, in through here, but one PV unit basically calculate a temperature uh, change of 10 degrees Kelvin over hundred hectopascal layer and a vorticity value of 10 to the minus four. That's the definition of one PV unit. So some, Potential vorticity concept that you all know from dynamics classes, first order advantages, conservation and invertibility, conserve for frictional adiabatic motion. Invertibility allows recovery of heights, winds and temperatures and invertibility requires a balance condition, a reference state, for example, potential temperature and top and bottom boundary conditions invert the, invert the PV field globally. However, to me, the most interesting aspect of PV is non-conservation because that's where the most exciting and interesting weather events occur. Um, I, I won't do well on this, but these are the Bible. The Bible is Hoskin, HMR. People know you just say HMR, you know what that is, uh, but who did that? And then follow up by Hoskins and Beresford in 1988, trying to get uh, some people to use it and to, for the weather people and, and the weather. And then Brian Hoskins of, uh, uh, looking at a potential vorticity viewpoint of synoptic development in 1997. Okay, anticyclonic wave breaking, downstream trough development and PV streamer formation. First of all, what is the PV streamer? It's an elongated filament of high potential vorticity air that has a high length to width aspect ratio. 
Uh, PV streamers correspond to cold upper level troughs and can be identified by following a PV contour on a theta surface that marks the dynamic tropopause. Why should you care? Well, this is what a PV streamer could look like. This is one from 2008. Uh, the wind, bar, wind arrows, are, the scale is 20, meter, whoop, 20 meters per second down there. Um, here's the east coast of the United States and here's the, over here the west coast of Africa. So note the anticyclonic wave breaking is going on upstream and you get this trough that extends equator of 20 degrees south in through here and PV unit about four. So this is a deep trough. Um, uh, these matter greatly because these, are, these can be a source of, of, of exporting tropical moisture to higher latitudes and also big severe rainstorms in the, in the subtropics. Um, so why should you care about these things? Instead, it, it, they can be linked to upstream Rossby wave breaking and downstream vericlinic development. Uh, and they associate with a variety of extreme weather events that usually centered around tropical moisture export on the east side. And the PV is thin and elongate. When you were, I don't know, when I was a kid, you had this rubber cement. I don't know if anybody has rubber cement anymore, but if you took the cap off the rubber cement and pulled it upward, the, 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 the stream basically thinned and then eventually broke. And the, that's the analogy. And when you do that, when the PV streamers thin and they break, you get cut off cyclone formation. formation. But once you have a, a slow moving cut off cyclone in lower, lower latitudes, that's a recipe for heavy rainfall related extreme weather events and big predictability problems. So re, the science question here associated recurving and transitioning West Pacific tropical cyclones and downstream impacts. How can a reconfiguration of the North Pacific flow induced by recurving and transitioning Western Pacific TCs trigger downstream baroclinic development in the current extreme weather events? All right, Heather Archambault, I'm a student of Dan Kaiser and, and me, we wrote this paper on looking at events when the uh, 272 events and looking, these are gonna show you the top quintile 54 events of how they impact the North Pacific jet stream then impact downstream predictability. So here's a diagram for a, a time mean of 54 events. The blue lines are potential vorticity units, two, four, six, and eight. The arrows are the uh, irrotational wind in meters per second uh, scaled that way. The shaded in gray is precipitable water starting at 40 millimeters. The red symbol here is the tropical cyclone. So when the tropical cyclone is beginning to interact with the mid latitude flow and through here and the green showing the 500 millibar ascent um, in through here. So what does this do to the, to, the, to the strength of the jet? Well, if you actually cap quantify the negative PV advection by the irritational wind, you get the red dashed lines in through here. If you now superimpose the wind speed, starting the light orange is at 40 meters per second, you see um, you're, all this is happening in the equator with jet entrance region of this system. So it, when recurving tri tropical cyclones interact with equator with jet entrance regions, all kinds of downstream mayhem usually results. And here's a composite of that for the 54 cases. And you can see where the TC is relative to the jet core and the thousand to five thickness. So ahead of the TC, as it's beginning to interact with the jet, um, you have loads of warm air advection, which is forcing strong ascent in the equator at entrance region to the jet. And then there's gonna be a predictable downstream impacts. To show you an example, super typhoon Nuri here in 2014 induces downstream baroclinic development. This was not too shabby of a TC. It got down to about 910 central hectopascal central pressure. And that was the track, but this is all source from digital typhoon, uh, the greatest best website ever for tropical cyclones that the Japanese run. Um, and then, but then they give up on the storm when it's no longer a TC. But then that's when things really start to get interesting because the resulting extratropical cyclone after the extratropical transition is sitting out here about the deepest cyclone, tropical, uh, extratropical cyclone tying it ever observed in the Pacific out and through here with broad cyclonic circulation. Well, what are the impacts? So we can look at this from induced downstream flow evolution uh, in schematics to avoid showing you the maps. This is the 4th of November at 0Z. Here's where Nuri is and the jets are the, are the colors in through here. And the flow pattern, and you can see there's a moderately amplified flow pattern. Uh, now, super typhoon Nuri. Now watch what happens as we go forward seven days. 
the remnants of Nuri are up and through here, but now you have downstream this big building omega block and the first cold surge coming into the US, H1 is there are gonna be three anticyclones. So building omega block, four days later, hard not to recognize an omega block. The first cold surge is dissipating in the Ohio Valley, but here comes the third, second cold surge and the third cold surge is waiting in the wings. There's the 18th of November. The blocking ridge is still in place. The ex Nuri cyclone is still sitting out here. And now you have these monumental cold surges coming down in November 2014. You can see it in a Havmaler format here, 35 to 55, 55 to 75 over here, 29 October to 28 November. So time runs down, 120 east to 60 west. So you can see where the height anomalies as it as Nuri when you see the colors here, it's in the, it's in the plane of this uh, cross section. Big height rises occur downstream of Nuri. Nuri is inducing out downstream ridging. And downstream of there, you get downstream troughing. Ridging becomes troughing further downstream. That's the downstream baroclinic development. You look at it in the V wind anomaly in through here. So you've got anomalous southerly flow here, anomalous northerly flow here, as big anticyclonic circulation develops ahead of the recurving Nuri. And then if you look at it at 850 millibar temperature at higher latitudes and here 55, anomalously warm downstream, anomalously cold and anomalously cold underneath the block as the block over, sits over below. And so that was the result. 2,677 minimum temperature records broken over the CONUS um, during this particular period, one of the 16th to the 22nd of November. Um, impacts. Uh, this guy in Buffalo had a bit of tunnel vision, for lack of a better term. Um, this guy had quite the load on his mind and pretty lazy about clearing off the snow. If, you, if he hits a bump and you're following him, look out. And, uh, but the CPC November CONUS temperature forecast is completely derailed. Here's the forecast for November 2014. That's what was observed. These recurving Western Pacific typhoons and they are, have huge impacts when they're able to interact with the westerlies as you deepen into the autumn season in through here. Um, and we just basically don't have any predictability on, on longer timescales of those kinds of events. So to finish up, we'll quickly uh, dynamical overview uh, on some vertical motion applications. I should point out that Sutcliffe, Kevin Trenberth, and I wanna make a point here, Kevin Trenberth is an internationally renowned climate scientists for very good reasons. Uh, we went to school together, but what people probably don't pe appreciate is that like Ed Lorenz, Kevin was grounded in weather. Um, he was forecasting and we worked for the New, New Zealand Met Service for a while. And after he came to the US, he eventually wound up at the University of Illinois and then spent a very productive career at NCAR. Trenberth built upon the Sutcliffe develop the famous Sutcliffe development equation of 1938 to show that vertical motion was mostly forced by the vorticity advection by the thermal wind. And you could get that by knowing just the surface sea level isobars, which converted to 1,000 millibar heights, and then calculating the 500 millibar analysis and doing a graphical subtraction to get the thickness. This is what, in, what was done in the Southern Hemisphere because there was so little data, and people did this manually and then with simple computer forms. At the same time, in the same year, Brian Hoskins did his, wrote his famous Q vector paper um, at all in through here, and the, the, the most Q vector in through here, and the forcing. So when del dot Q is negative, the right hand side is positive, which means omega is negative when you invert the Laplacian in through here. But note what I want to point out what the Q vector is it's the rate of change of the geostrophic wind along the flow dotted with the horizontal temperature gradient. So that suggests that things where there's shear along the flow and in temperature gradient regions, the Q vectors will be important. In 1990, uh, Fred Sanders and Brian Hoskins wrote a reader's guide to how to use Q vectors, estimate them from weather maps. And this came about because uh, a few years before this paper was published, Brian and I were talking, and he was lamenting why a lot of people were not really using Q vectors in forecast office and otherwise. And I remember saying, Brian, what you need to do is team up with somebody like Fred Sanders and write a paper, which is a user's guide to tell people how to use these things um, in, in languages that the forecasters will, will, will re resonate with. So that's what they did. And to make a long story short, look, the Q vector then depends upon the magnitude of the temperature gradient and 
the shear of the wind along the flow. So where is that Q vector going to be large? In jet entrance and jet exit regions where partial V sub G, partial X is large. But if you're dealing with a jet, you're going to have a horizontal temperature gradient. So where the horizontal temperature gradient is maximized in the north-south direction in this case, and when you have variation in wind speed along the x-axis, which say the thickness contours are oriented east-west. So you get more bang for your Q-vector bucks in jet entrance and jet exit regions, particularly for short stubby jets where the change with x of the wind speed is large. So here's one of the figures from the Sanders and Hoskin diagram that tells it. This is the classic four corners the way of, of uh, deformation zone for front, surface frontogenesis. When you have a pattern like this and your isotherms are the dashed lines and your flow is like this, that's going to tighten the temperature gradient. Now imagine taking just the right hand side of this diagram and putting it down here and looking upstairs. So now you have a confluent jet entrance region in through here and with, think of these as thickness contours. So along here, partial V sub G, partial X is increasing to the east. The temperature gradient, partial T, partial Y, is increasing to the south. K cross partial V sub G, partial X, is an at vector going to the right. So the Q vectors point towards rising warm air, uh, low level rising warm air, or away from cold air in through here. And the strength depends upon the gradient of temperature and the rate of change in wind speed along that temperature gradient, uh, along, that, along that thermal boundary. So they're going to be large in jet entrance and jet exit regions. And if you have a jet core here in the standard straight uh, jet model in through here, divergence, convergence, uh, divergence in through here, jet entrance region is right in through here. There's going to be a minimum value of vorticity here, a maximum value of vorticity here. So you have weak cyclonic vorticity advection on the right entrance region, strong cyclonic vorticity advection in the left exit region, and the Q vectors will be pointing in this direction towards rising low level warm air, rising warm air here, and the flow, you're looking at the arrows of the return flow aloft. So these circulations in jet entrance and jet exit regions are going to be proportional to, depends upon the strength and the rate of change of the wind speed along the flow. And the Q vector measures that. So jet streaks and S2S predictability Jet entrance and jet exit regions, I call the traffic cops of the atmosphere. Uh, transverse ageostrophic vertical circulations can be more vigorous in short stubby jets. Error growth is maximized in equator jet entrance regions where you typically have access to tropical moisture. Think back to what I, we just discussed about recurving tropical cyclones interacting with the equator jet entrance region of uh, uh, the North Pacific jet stream. Error growth is also maximized in the poleward left exit regions where areas when you have vigorous cyclogenesis. And again, if you have uncertainty in the strength of the wind flow relative to the temperature gradient in the jet exit region, that's going to lead to large error growth with mid latitude disturbances. So the last slide here um, would be key takeaways. Uh, synoptic dynamic thinking and weather analysis and interpretation skills must have a place at the S2S table if we're going to make sense of what is going on. Uh, forecast reliability remains as a challenge, remains a challenge on timescales beyond one week. Negative PV advection by the irritational wind ahead of recurving and transitioning West PAC TCs or West Atlantic TCs poses downstream predictability challenges on S2 timescales because one or two recurving TCs that interact with the jet can totally rearrange the downstream circulation. And the dynamics of vertical circulations in jet entrance and jet exit regions is a key governor of S2S predictability. And so it's time for me to shut up. Thanks a lot, Lance, that was a great, <laughs> talking a yeah, great bridge between the weather and how it connects to the climate through the S2S timescale.